Thank you very much. And I would like to thank the organizers for giving, giving me this opportunity. Um, I'm, it's really my pleasure always to, to come to France and, and Paris. I really enjoy uh, staying here. Um, so Alberto asked me to talk about this big data assimilation. Although I have been working on other, other things, I, today I focus on this, um, our uh, work on this topic. So uh, we have been working on this uh, research since 2013 when the Japanese government has the big data uh, oriented research program. That's a government uh, strategic program. And that was the first year, uh, if you think about six years ago, people we're talking about big data, not AI yet. And after like two or three years, uh, we started having this big data, uh, not just big data, but the AI. And now it's the era of AI. And our project actually finished uh, in March, uh, like six months ago. And, and now it's actually continuing. Uh, following this uh, previous effort on this big data assimilation under the project of AIP Network Laboratory. That's uh, also a Japanese strategic, uh, government strategy. Okay, so let me first introduce myself and uh, my group. So this is my group. We have about 15 scientists working on data assimilation, on various aspects. But uh, my background is meteorology, so 80% about meteorology. Uh, maybe 20% something else. Uh, myself, I graduated from Kyoto University, got a bachelor's degree, and then I started working for the Japanese weather service for like three years. And then I had a chance to study at the University of Maryland. Uh, graduate school, I had a strict two-year uh, time limit because of uh, Japanese government program. And I completed a PhD under uh, Professor Eugenia Kalne. So this was my record, uh, well, the record uh, of uh, PhD in Maryland. I heard. I just tell you that I know Masaki Moto had to go back after two years. Yeah, he right. He almost <laughs> finished his PhD in two years. Yes, yes, I, I, I know. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Professor Kimoto is now at the University of Tokyo, and he was also with the same Japanese government program to study at UCLA, and that was 18 years before uh, before me. And I'm I'm the I was the second from JMA to study in the U.S. University, by the way. And um, I went back to JMA, the Japanese Meteorological Agency. Uh, to develop the ensemble camera filter system with the Japanese operational system. And then uh, I uh, went to University of Maryland as a faculty. And about seven years ago, I uh, moved to Riken in Kobe, where we have a supercomputer like this. So this was very attractive to me, because uh, I didn't have a big supercomputer in Maryland. And uh, now I have this, although this is um, shut down, <laughs> stopped in the end of August. So this was uh, called K-Computer, the Japanese flagship supercomputer, uh, a billion dollar or billion euro project. It's really exp expensive supercomputer. I think uh, the world's most expensive supercomputer and it was like 80 years old, and 80 years old may be equivalent to like 80 years old in human age, like one year may be equal to 10 years in human age, so it's time to retire. So it retired, and now uh, we are building the next one. The next one will be like 100 times more powerful, so we are waiting for that. Maybe it will take one or one and a half years from now. So we are waiting, so we have time to write papers and analyze all the data that we got. That's a really huge data. With this supercomputer, my colleagues have developed this very high resolution uh, global um, weather simulation. 
So this is at um, 870 meter mesh. So this is really high resolution, still the highest resolution ever in the world. This has been done, uh, published in 2013 when we started our big data assimilation project. So this was really amazing. And at the same time, I also had a chance to look at this data from the real uh, the radar data. So this radar uh, was developed in 2012 in Japan, in Osaka University. And this is the actual data from the radar. So this is really amazing. If you are a meteorologist, you have never seen an image like this. So this is a face array uh, radar like this, and this gives us a hundred times of more data than the conventional type of radar. Uh, because this radar can get only a single line of sight, but uh, this radar can get a plate, well, the plane. So it's a hundred, hundred levels at the same time. So that's why we get a hundred times of more data. So this is the source of the big data. So we have two amazing things to combine. Uh, one is a model, the other is the observation. So what we do is big data assimilation. So that's the original idea that we got in 2013. So with this, uh, I thought that we could predict the heavy rain, although we cannot uh, evaporate the heavy rain. Um, so the, the general idea is like this. So we have new sensors that gives us 100 times more data. And we have the very powerful supercomputer that we can process this big data. And also we can produce more, even bigger data from these huge simulations. So the idea is to combine these two through data assimilation. So we developed a system to test in the real case uh, that happened in 2014 in September. Um, so I live here, uh, my office is here, I biked every morning. Um, it, ta it takes me 30 minutes by biking. I looked at this image. I'm a PhD in meteorology. I'm an expert in weather forecasting. Um, I looked at this image and I decided to bike. And it, I, it took me like 30 minutes to arrive. And it's just at the tip of this island. And I was OK. But if I knew that this happened, so this red part is really heavy rain. It's a hard, like 80 millimeters per hour. So it's really heavy rain. So I would never biked if I knew that this happened. So this was important. And because I was a PI, I could do this experiment. <laughs> OK. Um, so we did this experiment. So this is Japan, and this is Kobe. Yeah. And on top left, we have the actual observed data. And on top right, we will have the simulation in the model with the data assimilated from this observation. And bottom left is a regular uh, system that we cannot really predict this event. Okay, Just ignore the bottom right. So we have the rapid development of this convective system. We assimilate every 30 seconds. So it takes time to spin up, but we can spin up in like 10 or 20 minutes. We have nothing if we have no observation. OK, so it took us like three years to make this work. So every 30 seconds, we just put the data. And this is a really dense three-dimensional volume data. So the model go, tried to go somewhere else, but we put the data to drag the model closer to the observation. And that produced lots of noise. And it was really a lot of work to make it work. And then uh, finally, we, we got it to work. And now we have the clouds that are not visible from the radar, because it's, the droplets are too small. But we can have the clouds consistently with the observed radar image. And also, we could even fly inside of this um, heavy rain, although we would never do it in the real life. Um, that's the advantage of the simulation. I actually showed this to uh, a congressman, and they agreed the importance of this type of research. I hope that we get more funding <laughs> from government. So this image is available on YouTube, so you can 
see it. And RIKEN is a Japanese flagship uh, research institute in all science fields. And RIKEN has several thousand of contents in this YouTube RIKEN channel. And this is ranked number seven. So if you are kind enough to click to find out this, then we can change this digit. I would really appreciate your help uh, making this higher rank. Okay, so this is a result that we got. It took us, again, three years. Um, we couldn't predict. We, we would never predict this event because it happens in 10 minutes. It rapidly grow. And if we assimilate once in an hour, it's no way, no, no, we cannot predict. But here, if we assimilate every 30 seconds, we can predict this type of events. Okay, so we, if we think about how we do science at, in meteorology or I, I other science fields too, we learn from observations or experiment, experiments. So we get data. But those data from the real world is usually noisy or sometimes missing. So there are some problems with the data. But uh, we get the fundamental knowledge from the data by dealing with the noise. So we extract what is the, the law behind the data. That's the human knowledge. So this is known as the first science. That's experimental science. And then uh, the, the theory develop the theory by itself. That's a second science, that's a theoretical. And based on the theory, we can model the real world. Then the model can make the simulation. So that's the beginning of the third science. It's a computational science that gives us uh, new knowledge just based on the computer uh, computations that, that the humans cannot do. So human can develop the model, but uh, we cannot solve the equations by hand to, to predict the weather for tomorrow. But the computers can do a lot of computations in a short time, and that can produce uh, what we cannot know just by the theory. And that will give us new knowledge. But uh, the model always have errors, and we don't know how much we can trust the model. So that's the problem of this computational science. So now it's the era of data-centric science. It's also known as the data science. It's a fourth paradigm. So the big data that we get beyond the human ability that we can process, so we have this machine that can learn from the data to produce the new knowledge. So that's the idea of this data-centric science. And if we think about the data assimilation, the data assimilation combines both the experiments or the observation data and the simulation. These are completely different things, but we can combine through data assimilation. So what I was thinking is that using data assimilation, at least the idea of data assimilation, we can combine the human knowledge with the machine and the data and computation. So that can be the, the fifth science. So that's a new paradigm that we can create. So the data simulation can produce something more than observations or simulations. And these are, again, completely different um, approach to the science. So if we look at the workflow of data assimilation, so we have this simulation based on the human knowledge, but that human knowledge comes from the data. So we make the observations and learn from the observations to draw the, uh, the equations or the, the knowledge. And then these equations can make the world, the, how the world behaves. So, uh, but here we get the observations to synchronize because the system is chaotic and not uh, completely predictable. So we always need to plug in the observations. That the knowledge itself is not good enough. So we have the observation operator here and the DA algorithm. So this is the, the workflow. Uh, uh, we can do many things with 
data assimilation. So we have achieved many things with data assimilation. Okay, let me go back to the big data assimilation. What we have done with this big data assimilation project was to combine the data from these new sensors and the, the large supercomputer. All of these uh, combinations uh, can, could do this simulation. So this was a 30 second update, 100 meter mesh, uh, one hour prediction. So that's what we were, we were doing. Also, uh, we explored a large ensemble because uh, in data simulation, the PDF is essential. So we run 10,240 ensemble member, ensemble common filter computation to look at, for example, this uh, PDF. If we increase the sample size or the ensemble size, uh, that is equivalent to increase the resolution of probability. This, well, the probability representation. So with 20, 40, 80, up to 10,240, we have three peaks, but the three peaks appears only when we have more than 1,000 ensemble members. Okay, uh, this is another example of the map of um, non-Gaussian metric. That's a kullback library divergence from the Gaussian PDF. Uh, this, if we consider this 10,000 ensemble members are the truth, uh, 600 is too small to see the difference from the, the um, Gaussian PDF. So 1,000 is like minimum to capture the non-Gaussian PDF accurately. So uh, we also look at the covariance structure with 100 members, 10,000 members. Uh, we still have a long range covariance. That was to our surprise. Uh, because we usually localize only within several thousand, well, a few thousand kilometers, but it reached up to 10,000 kilometers away. And yeah, this is nice. And if we, we consider this difference of the ensemble size, um, we run idealized um, OSI experiment to, to measure the forecast error. This is the forecast root mean scale error, the U winds at uh, 500 millibar, uh, well, hectopascal, I should say. Well, so one day forecast error with 80 ensemble members was almost equivalent to five day forecast error with 10,240. There are many lines, but if you look at this red line, that is when we remove the localization, uh, we could get the most from the same observations. So this is the potential of the improvement that we can get by running a large ensemble members. Okay, so what we have done with this big data assimilation research was to push all the limits in ensemble common filter. So, so we have the big data and combined with the big simulations. So we uh, run the big ensemble, as I showed, and the rapid update, it's a 30 second update, it's 120 times more rapid than hourly update. And high resolution, it's a 100 meter mesh. It's 100 times more grid points than one kilometer mesh. The one kilometer is usual uh, resolution for convective scale. Okay, so all of these are two orders of magnitude more, and we try to see what will be the future of numerical weather prediction. So that has been done um, in the previous project, and uh, we proposed the extension for three more years under a different project, although it's related. Uh, it's an um, AIP network lab. That's a Japanese government program on the AI applications. So we extended our scope of our research, uh, big data simulations here. We get the big data from uh, new sensors. Uh, we get the simulation, but we try to expand the area of the prediction in the cyberspace, and we would like to react what will happen in our life in the real world. So we cannot control the nature, at least at this moment, although we would like to. <laughs> but we cannot control, but we can control what we react. So that's the human domain. So that's why we would like to include this part so that we can control ourselves to react properly to, to minimize the 
cost or the, the disaster risk. Okay, so to synchronize, predict, and control. That's the, the idea. So the Kalman filter, as you all know, is the algorithm for control, optimal control. So we should use the Kalman filter for control, not just prediction. So that's the idea. Okay, so in this AIP acceleration research, we have four goals, main goals. One is to look for the combination with the AI, artificial intelligence. That's kind of forcing um, from this program. So, it's, yeah, to get funded for research, we needed to do something. And international collaborations, and also the demonstration at Tokyo 2020. It's uh, Olympic Games uh, next year. So we developed this 30-second uh, update, heavy rain press, uh, prediction system for real-time operation. So that's what we are doing right now, and also societal impacts. So we have also been developing um, purely data-driven method to use this data from the phase array to predict 10 minutes ahead uh, precipitation, the rain forecast. So this is a 10 minutes, uh, so it's quite accurate compared with the actual observation. So we can capture the heavy rain. Uh, this is Lake Biwa, the south of Lake Biwa, Kyoto city. And we had the heavy rain here, and we can predict 10 minutes ahead. So this is available. It seems that it's frozen somehow. OK. Uh, OK, so this is available through the, the smartphone app. Uh, so we are now developing the English version of this smartphone app to prepare for Tokyo Olympic Games. But at this moment, only Japanese version available. But still, it's ranked number three in Japan uh, iOS application. And it's more than 247,000 downloads. So if you visit Tokyo Olympic Games, you <laughs> thank you very much for using this app. Um, so we are now trying to improve our uh, data-driven um, prediction using this uh, deep learning uh, technology. So, so far, what we have developed was this motion vector-based um, approach. It's a simple uh, optical flow, so it's just an advecting system. And now we are developing this. What is this? So we combine the long short-term memory, that's a neural network. OK. And convolutional neural network, so that's a deep learning. So this is known as a convolutional LSTM, and a previous study showed that uh, this is effective for two-dimensional RAIN image. So we expanded this to the three-dimensional uh, RAIN image, because we have very dense uh, observation every 30 seconds. And these methods are very effective if you have big data. So you have very dense data, almost no missing data. And when the data is good, this method works well. So uh, here we have the past uh, like five minutes image it going into this algorithm. And then this will predict the future image. So, so f for the moment, we predict up to two and a half minutes due to the computational uh, limitation for training. This LSTM, the problem of the LSTM is that we cannot parallelize the training. So even though we have many GPUs, we can use only one GPU to, to train. So that's why it's a, it's a big problem at the moment, but still we can make the two and a half minutes uh, prediction. So this um, LSTM can take the future image to the future data. But we have no future data, so we have nothing to put in the future. So for the moment, we get the past data to predict the future. Okay, And this is a two and a half minutes prediction, just a single example. So this is the actual observation, two and a half minutes later. And this is a prediction from the LSTM. And this is a prediction from the, the current system, the optical flow. So it's clear that this image looks more like this than this. 
So the LSTM is almost always better. So this is effective. So in the future, we were thinking, because um, this part, the future image, can be this. Because we, we can run the model that's uh, physically based, based on the human knowledge. And we would like to put this image to improve this data-driven method. And that is actually a combination of the data-driven approach and the process-driven approach. OK, I will finish in one minute. Um, this is uh, the last slide. So I already showed this uh, whole workflow of data assimilation. And uh, we were thinking how to use the AI technologies or the machine learning technologies um, in, in this algorithm. But well, so we, we usually think about using the machine learning libraries or those within this algorithm. But what I thought was effective would be to integrate the algorithmic level of these approaches. I think some of the audiences already have been doing that kind of research, but that's, I, I think, will be important because the mathematics behind the machine learning and data assimilation are very similar, if you look carefully. So, but the machine learning, the mathematics or the algorithms in machine learning developed in a very different way. So there are something that, that we have in the DA community, although the machine learning community doesn't have, or vice versa. So we could uh, try to uh, integrate those ideas in the mathematical level that will lead to the new development. And also what is important here, another important point is the learning. So all of these uh, machine learning algorithms requires a lot of data to learn and train. So this training requires the data to be stored and the training algorithm to, to run. At this moment, if we run the supercomputing uh, simulations, those data are huge. Um, we cannot save all. So we need to, move to save some of the data to move it to the computer where we run the training algorithm. But uh, the next generation computer that, that we are developing in Japan uh, can, is, is also efficient for the machine learning uh, training. So we were thinking we try to learn big computation data uh, that will be multi petabytes or even more. Uh, data that the uh, high resolution simulation can generate. Uh, we don't move the data, or we, we don't even save the data. We just stream the data to the learning algorithm um, on HPC. So the HPC can run the, high, high, the large simulation as well as the big training algorithm. So that's something necessary for the future, and that's something that we can look for uh, integrating the DA and AI to pioneer the new meteorology. Thank you for your attention. I uh, must say that uh, Eugenia Kalnai told me that, you know, you were terrific. But anybody who knows Eugenia knows that anybody who worked with her is terrific. But you, Miyoshi-san, are more terrific. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, uh, he pointed to me, uh, Lenny. Uh, Thank you. If you could run back about 14 slides, you have one that has at the top of it uh, something like big. The advantages of big. Oh, that was it. The advantages of large. Uh, the advantages of large ensembles. Yes, large ensemble. Okay. I think what was this one? No, the advantages of large ensembles. Stop there. So it, it, I, I agree that that, I like the two PDFs on the right. What are they, but I, I would question what they are PDFs of. Ah, this is a humidity. No, I mean, so, I think, I think if, having done the same thing with, with large ensembles of climate models, I think they are, they are really, they are probably excellent ways of getting probability forecasts for the next model one. I wonder what they have to do with what the weather will be. And then, Actually, you showed a graph later, say on this one, you showed a graph later, that's my question, my, the, the, 
the comment is, you showed a graph later showing how the root mean square forecast error had been, but if you look at that, if you go back, if you look at the one in the middle, it's bimodal. You don't want to use root mean square forecast error ever, actually, but you certainly don't want to use it in this case because it won't show the skill you have in this bimodal sort of forecast. So yes. I'm curious if you look at probabilistic evaluation and also what do you really think that's a, that's a PDF of? Okay, so this is a PDF of uh, relative humidity. This is 16.2 16, 16 at the percent relative humidity. And the humidity fields tend to have more non-Gaussian structure, like this bimodal structure. And I, what I showed here is uh, winds. The winds are mostly Gaussian. We almost never see non-Gaussian uh, PDF. So, well, it doesn't guarantee that the Gaussian never based... Never heard it in two different places. Mm, uh, well, before. not, well, so the ensemble members, 10,000 ensemble members have slightly different locations, ended up with the Gaussian PDF. Maybe they put it on the skewed fields, I think. Um, okay. So thank you, thank you for, for your talk. Uh, um, I was wondering, you showed uh, an application of uh, deep learning technique for forecasting, effectively. So I was curious, how does it compare with uh, a dynamical forecast started from uh, a standard data simulation experiment? Um, so you mean the big data simulation experiment? There is no standard data simulation experiment, actually. Um, yeah, so, so uh, that's a very good point. So, so we didn't compare because we didn't implement uh, feeding this part yet. But, but uh, this, in general, combines the data-driven prediction with, so this contains the bias correction of everything, the systematic error correction from the model. So this tried to match with the, the data, even though the model has the bias. So uh, yeah, this is a model output statistics, so that's why we hope that this is better than the, the regular numerical error prediction. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.